Hey guys, Jim here from Drink a Beer, Play a Game. Welcome to Power Hour 77. How are you doing? Uh, I am going alone today. Uh, so, quick slice of real life. Um, there, Brian had, they lost someone in his wife's side of the family, so he had to take the week off for obvious reasons. He's got to be there for his family. So, you know, the person who passed, it wasn't anything, you know, surprising, but... Still very sad. He was a super nice guy, and he's going to be missed. So Brian's there, you know, for his family, as he should be. And I figured I'd still keep the train running on these uh, weekly episodes. So I'd throw one up here, keep it kind of short, a little more casual than we normally do. But want to make sure that we had something out here for you guys. So please bear with me. We will see how big of a fraud I actually am when it comes to podcasting. So going right into the usual uh, what we are drinking, and tonight, I am drinking the Got Me Through College by the T Tioga Sequoia Brewery out of Fresno, California. It is a blood orange ale, and it comes in at 5% alcohol by volume, so nothing crazy there. Uh, from the looks of it, there's like almost no head, uh, very minimal carbonation, a little bit of bubbles coming from there, almost see through -y? It's it almost looks like... It's almost like a flat Budweiser looking ish beer, just a little bit more on the yellowy side, I guess, or the amber brownish. I'm good at this. But let's, uh, it's got a lot. Ooh, man, you can smell that. You can smell that blood orange coming through there. Very citrusy aroma to it. Um, wait, 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 wait. Have to keep the tradition going. Here's the U grad. We made this blood orange ale with you and your graduation celebrations in mind. Cheers to your accomplishments! Ah, you know what? That isn't as fun when I don't get to torture Brian with it. And, but, um, yeah, about that little bit that I do. So, I originally started just to make fun of beer snobs who, like, really are overly into what they do with their little sayings on the side of beer cans, and then it eventually morphed into just me copying the old Zagat skits from SNL. So, yeah, I'm Chris Farley. Hi. And just like a lot of shit on this podcast, I just ripped it off something more successful. Like, um, when we say to go to iTunes and leave us a five-star review, but, you know, feel free to trash us. I stole that from Who Are These Podcasts. And overrated, underrated. I used to say it all the time, but I ripped that straight off Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast, so... I am the least original guy that you can get, but it fills out content, doesn't it? Ooh. Ooh, wow. Okay, just took my sip of the beer, and yeah, that is straight citrus. That just grabbed the back of my throat, like, instantly. So, yeah, surprising amount of flavor there. It's a little, little tart, but not in the good sour kind of tart way. Ooh, man. Yeah, that is um, that is an interesting one. I'll have to come back to that. But uh, other normal intro. What have I been playing lately? And to be honest with you, it has not been a lot. I man, I slept like shit this past week. So anytime I normally game during the course of a week, it's when like after my kid and wife go to bed, and I'll stay up, you know, past my bedtime, be tired for work the next day, and. And after the recording the podcast last week, I was just dead tired and could not catch up. So I tried to go to bed early, and then I'd be up in the middle of the night. So I didn't get a lot done, but did play two games. Um, this one's a Yokoi Kids game. Did a few posts on it. It is Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters, the sequel to the NS original. And it is kicking my ass. I do plan on doing some kind of Yokoi Kids related video for it. I just don't know what the hell I'm going to do yet. For those who don't know, it's... It's side scrolly, but the horizontal part of the levels will go, they will loop, and infinitely. So, you can go left to right for as much as you want, but it's all about, like, climbing these levels to the very top, and basically the doors in the levels are almost like checkpoints. So you go in through some, and you have to fight off waves of enemies, some give you power-ups. So it's a lot of exploration and a lot of platforming with some action in there. And, yeah, I'm really bad at it. I'm stuck on level 1-3 right now, where I keep game-overing, which is very, very embarrassing. So, I don't know if maybe I'll do a drunk run where I try to beat the level I'm stuck on drunk, or... I don't know, I'll do something. It's just a weird one. It's not one that I can make, like, an easy drinking game out of. But we'll see. And, of all games, uh, I have been 
the other night we downloaded Uno on the Switch, of all games. And my wife isn't a gamer. She'll play Mario Party and she'll play Mario Kart with me, but I downloaded that as a way for her and her best friend who lives in St. Louis to be able to play, you know, a game and waste some time together. And at first, she was like, tell me you did not spend $10 on goddamn Uno on the Switch. And yeah, I'd already bought it at that point. So she made her best friend download it. And at first, she was mad that I spent the 10 bucks, but then two hours later, she was up until 1.30 in the morning playing. So mission accomplished. If, if you want some Uno on the go and you don't have the cards, it's not a bad version. I'll just throw it out there. A little overpriced at 10 bucks, a little very overpriced, but hey, at least you get online multiplayer out of it. So that's what I've been playing this week. And as we always do on this show, we're going to jump right into the Patreon questions. So... Patreon.com slash drink a beer and play a game, where for as little as $2 a month, you can ask a question that we will answer on each and every Power Hour podcast. Beer sip. And yeah, um, <laughs> thank God you guys came through because I was like, shit, what am I going to talk about for this episode? But we got a good amount of questions in here. So first up, from G to the next level. What are your favorite portable games that were not on the Game Boy? Cheers. Ooh, that is a good question. Um, see, the problem for me is, and I've mentioned it before, and I have to get around to making this video one day. I didn't grow up with a Game Boy or a Game Gear. I either played my cousins or my friends' is 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 is. So I had this knockoff one that you could buy at Boscov's, and it was sold during ECW uh, tapings. It's called the Pro 400 Gaming System, and it's one of those LCI multi-games. It says 400 games, but really it's like 20-some games and hundreds of variations of them. So you'll get, like, Wacky Tetris or Wacky Space Invaders, stuff like that. And I, I'm going to make a video on it just so you guys know exactly what I mean. But I played a ton of games on that goddamn thing, i got to tell you. And even with its, like, janky, stiff D-pad... It's breakout coins and stuff like that were still pretty fun. Um, yeah, besides that, I had, like, this one basketball uh, Tiger LCD-ish game that, of course, it wasn't even Tiger because I wanted it like a church bingo event. And I played the hell out of that. Like, it took me, like, 20, 30 tries just to beat the, just to win a game of it. Like, that thing was hard. It had shoulder buttons and, like, dual stick control. It was weird, but it was weirdly playable, I gotta say. And if I had to go with, like, a real, you know, uh, portable gaming uh, system game, uh, growing up, anytime I'd be around my cousin, I would be able to play his Game Gear. Like, he would bring it over when we'd all go to Grandma's to visit and stuff like that. So I'd sit in the corner with it and kill his batteries, and I'd always go back to either Sonic Chaos or the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers game that was on it. Like, Power Rangers? No, Power Rangers was at my friend's house. And Sonic and the X-Men game. One of the X-Men games for it. Those were my go-tos. And I actually have gone back and I was able to pick up most of the Sonic games for it. And I had the Power Rangers game. Which is like a weird quasi-fighting game. And I don't have X-Men yet. So one of these days for nostalgia i got to track it down. It's kind of like the Genesis X-Men. Just not as good. It's based around the Hellfire Club. Anyone who's played it from the era will probably know what I'm talking about. But... Yeah, those are those are the very few games I was ever really able to go back to a lot. So, thanks for that, bud. And, yeah, I'm from one of those areas where no one heard of the Turbo Express, no one heard of the Neo Geo Pocket Color, or any of that crap. Man, of course, Wonder Swan didn't come out here. So, those are all moot point. Anything would have been on the Game Gear. Next up, from Game Whisperer, Dean. Sega is back in the manufacturing game with the Genesis Mini and the Astro City Mini. Do you think this means that Sega will make a new console ever? No. Short answer, no. Long answer, no, and they shouldn't. They make... Sega's kind of a mess, just in general, as a company. Like, Sega's a company that, like, still sticks around despite itself. Like, their bad decisions in the 90s made them lose the console war made them kicked out of the console race. Like they're they're fine being publishers and they occasionally make the game here and there, but they uh, it's a thing that like a lot of retro gamers would love to see Sega do, but what like there wouldn't be enough people in the world who would care. There wouldn't be enough who would buy it at that point. 
And I just don't see, unless they made an actual console and put the money into it, it's such a risk to try and jump into the market at this point. Like, even niche stuff, like the Intellivision Amico, I think is, like, doomed to failure. And that's not even trying to compete. But I think Sega would have a better shot. But I just don't think they should ever even really try. Like, Sega of Japan... Here's a weird thing about Sega, for those who don't know. Sega of Japan hates it when things are successful in the West. Like, they hated the fact that the Genesis sold more in North America than it did in Japan. They hated the fact... Like, that's why we had the weird early release... They hated the 32X, and they didn't want to really program for it, so they kind of sabotaged it. Like, they always just... There's there's, there's a very weirdly arrogant company that wants its Japan roots to stay firm and to the expense of everyone else and themselves. So, yeah, I just could not ever see that working out. Next up, from Eric Lowacki. The best Bond that isn't named Connery. Best Bond, best Bond. Um, all right, so I'm not the biggest James Bond fan in the world. Like, I can sit there and watch the movies. That's no problem. But I never got, like, super in-depth into them. Uh, the Roger Moore movies are good, but, you know, they're a lot goofier. I like... See, here's the problem, like, with the Pierce Brosnan ones. GoldenEye is so good, and the rest of them are so bad. Like... Um, Tomorrow Never Dies is okay, it's quotable, but a guy with a super ship because he wants to control all the news? Like, really? And then Die Another Day and all that crap, like, yeah, yeah, he he was kind of a one and done. Um, George Lazenby only had, what, two movies, I think? So can't really count him. There is the first Casino Royale, which was like a comedy spoof, so that doesn't really count. And then you have Daniel Craig. So, I think the Daniel Craig movies in general are solid. Like, even... What the what was the one where fucking... Not Oracle. Uh, I can't remember the name. The one where, like, they were trying... Like, the big baddie was trying to control all the water in some Middle Eastern country. Which, I don't know, man. Some, some of these movies you had, like, these really high stakes, like, world-ending kind of bad guys. And then other ones you had stuff that was so specific and so weird. But I guess you put in Baron Samedi and stuff like that. I don't know. So I guess I'll probably go with, for me, I'll go with uh, Daniel Craig. I think the movies, even if they're not great, they're solid for the most part. Like, it doesn't have a lot of lows. And the the Roger Moore ones are a little too hokey for me at this point. They're a little too old. So I can't really say I'm fully behind them. But yeah, Daniel Craig, he does a solid job. Even though the movies come out once every like seven years at this point. Uh, next up, from Gamer Astral, the eternal question of Diddy Kong Racing versus Mario Kart 64. I've said this before, and I will say it again. Diddy Kong Racing is a better game in general. It's got more modes. It's very much more fleshed out. There's a lot more to do. There's stuff to unlock. And it's racing action in general. It's good, and it's more dynamic and diverse. But Mario Kart's just more fun. Like, I just, I, besides the fact that uh, Mario Kart 64 is one of my favorite games ever, I just, like, the levels are iconic, and they got reused in so many sequels. They always pulled from that game. The music is top-tier, god-notch in that game. God-notch? God-tier. Top-notch in god-tier. Yeah, I I mixed those two around. And, um, yeah. I just, mother, goddamn flying here. But... Yeah, I just got to go with Mario Kart 64. And I mean, and I know a ton of it's going to be nostalgia. And for a question like that in general, it's just going to come down to nostalgia for the most part. But yeah, if you if you go back to the N64, I also think it runs slightly better. I think Diddy Kong is a little too ambitious for its own good. So I just don't think like the, it performs fine, but I just always felt like it was weirdly slow for a kart racer. Maybe that's just me. I didn't spend nearly as much time with it, but yeah, I'm, I'm a Mario Kart guy. And last up, from Alex Perez. You mention all the time how you think stories and games are not important, correct? But are there any games you've played where you've become completely engrossed in the story and considered it a highlight? Good question, because I'm going to get into it in a couple minutes. But... I like I know that my general meme is that stories don't matter in games, but I can get sucked into a story. Like when I was a kid, 
the first, like, I am one of those guys who loves Ocarina of Time, especially because I played it when it was first new. And that whole world and the story that it was telling and the mystery around it, like, that sucked me in. Like, I love the story. I love the epic feel and nature of it. I loved, you know, going back and saving characters that I knew when I was a kid as an adult and stuff like that and seeing how the world evolved. Like, I know it's a pretty basic answer, but Ocarina really drew me in. And I mentioned it in when we did the review of it. But Shadowrun on the Genesis, that that really sucked me in. And that was like the first real RPG-ish kind of game that I had ever played. And when I first went into it, I didn't even know what I was doing. I didn't realize that I was supposed to talk to all the shop owners and go on these Shadow Runs. But as the story started to unfold and I actually figured out the plot elements and moved it along, and then it threw in all of its little surprises and throwbacks to the actual story itself and the beginning cinematic, and when you find this super secret character, a lot of it just came together to me that it just it just sucked me in. And I just wanted to learn more about the world and learn more about the game behind the video game itself. And I think it's a good story that it tells, too. It's a nice little revenge mystery whodunit with a lot of cybernetic mysticism thrown in there. So, it's a... It's an odd duck, but I really do love the hell out of that game. And what would I say would be a blah, 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 like a more recent? I want to go with another more recent game too. And thinking about, like, I could almost go with some of the Bethesda games. I I, I want to say Fallout Three almost because when I had my like RPG resurgence kind of phase, like Fallout Three was the one that really drew me in. But I think it was definitely more for the story highlights and the big epic uh, moments and just the overall the way the game played as opposed to the general story of the game itself. Besides Liberty Prime at the very end, I probably couldn't really tell you any real plot points from the game. So that's a little bit of a downer. Um, I don't think any real action game ever drew me in story. Oh, you know what? Okay. All right. I got one. And we've beaten this horse. We've beaten a dead horse with it, but I love the lore and the story behind the Resident Evil games. I love how it built on itself over time. I love, you know, how deep the roots of Umbrella went, just not even in that world, but just expanded out from there. All the Las Plagas and the enemy, you know, sea demons and stuff like that from 4 and 5, they're okay. But they've never been as interesting as anything Umbrella related. So I just loved how the story carried over from 1 to 2 to 3 to Code Veronica. And seeing the intro in Zero. And all the characters and side characters that just got left behind and you never hear from again. There's, It's definitely one of those ones that they made up as they go along. But it's always so goofy and interesting that I just fall in love with it. And yeah, that's probably about it. I would like to say that a fighting game... Oh, you know what? I really liked the story in Mortal Kombat 9. I really, really liked what they did with that. I love how they basically went to Armageddon and went, this series is a clusterfuck. And they just decided that they were going to reboot everything and go back in time. And I love the way they did that and introduced the characters and explained them a little bit more. When we made our top 10 you know, worst characters lists, a lot of people will be like, you shouldn't hate Stryker and Tanya because, or Rain because they're really cool now in 9 and 10. And very, very fair point. I'm just saying that growing up with them, they were lame and no one cared about them. So we would never remake those videos. And our, our bad take top 10s are always our most viewed videos, but that's why no one ever sticks around, I guess. But no, that's a good question. Like, story can definitely add to a game. But I've said before, I just never care enough. And I've tried... I've tried with the big RPGs and the JRPGs, and I just can never care. Maybe it's just, maybe those Japanese kind of stories aren't for me. Like, I loved Fantasy Star Online and playing that, but I think because that was more grindy and just more gameplay focused than it ever was with story. So, there you go. But those are some of these stories that have ever drawn me in. So, once again, guys, drink a beer and play a game on Patreon, $2 a month. You can ask a question every single week that we will answer. So once again, thank you so much, guys. Great questions as usual. Um, didn't think I'd go off on story. That might be the most I've ever gone off on stories that I've liked on this page and definitely this podcast. But even beyond that, great questions, everyone. And 
make sure to get them in for next week because we will have right now we have penciled in a special guest to come on next week and it'll be one that a lot of you guys will enjoy ah okay i need a beer break So before I get going, uh, I've been sipping on this got me through college beer for the most part, and it's it's not great. Here's here's my problem with the beer. It's almost like biting into an actual grapefruit. And I know this is a blood orange, but I've never bitten into a blood orange, so this is the sensation I'm experiencing. And a lot of the time when you have a blood orange beer of any kind, it'll give you the taste of blood orange without the bitterness and just the that clawing feeling in the back of your throat. Like if you ever just bit straight up into a grapefruit, just that that bitterness that you can't really describe unless you've done it, that's what I'm getting with every sip of this. Like it just instantly crawls back there. So it just instantly grabs you. Like it's got it's got flavor and it's got a good aroma to it, but I don't know, unless you really like those overly citrusy, that like pure experience of biting just straight citrus, I don't know if I can recommend it for you. It's not bad per se, but it's definitely one that I would never go back to. But it's it's cool that, you know, like I said before, I love this Craft Beer King box that I have. And oh, there's, there's another site update. I actually plan on doing a quick video on this box and, you know, explaining it like I did with the Craft Beer box. So you can expect that hopefully by Friday of this week. I'm recording on Monday the 17th, so... It'll probably be late because everything I do is, but you can hold me to that. So keep an eye out for that video. But it, just in general, I love the variety that this box gives. So unfortunately, this is not a go back to kind of beer, but I mean, it'll get me through this episode. So I can't complain about that too much. All right. So with that out of the way, I'm going to move into the only topic I have, and I'm going to keep this one a little personal. It's one that I've wanted to do a video on for a little while. But I just never knew how I wanted to go about it. It's basically, if you've ever watched Happy Console Gamer, this will probably remind you a lot of that. And I wanted to talk about, you know, in keeping in mind with the importance of family and stuff like that, my favorite bundle of games that I ever got. And if you've been following this page for a long time and you watched our Shadowrun review, I, I, I touched on this story at the end of that video. I think I spent like two minutes talking about it. But I really want to go back and discuss what got me these games and in a lot of ways how it really shaped me as a gamer at this point so one day i was sitting there i had to be about nine or ten years old um i was finishing up homework for the night and my dad was a cop for 37 years in philly so he would randomly go to different stores down in his precinct so one day he came home from a west coast video that i think was either going out of business or he just decided to treat me for whatever reason so he came home with this pile of six games, which, I mean, I only ever got games when I had a report card, basically. Maybe if we were going to the mall and they wanted to shut me up, they would take me to EB Games and let me... I would always look through the used game section for the Genesis, because that's all I had at that point. And they would let me get something that would be like, you know, 20 bucks or less. You know, shut me up, make me happy, that kind of deal. But then one night, like just completely unprovoked and for no reason at all, he came home with this stack of games. And at first I was like, holy crap, free games, more games, six games. This is amazing. This is the best day ever. And the weird thing is that not a lot of them were games that I'd even known or even heard about. So those six games are Eternal Champions, Streets of Rage 3, Shadowrun, which I'd already mentioned, Super Street Fighter 2, which I mention all the time, Predator 2, and that is a loud noise, I apologize, and Universal Soldier. And I just, ha I love not only how diverse for the most part these games are, but, you know, like I said, I'm not the story game kind of guy, I've never really cared that much, but these are just games that in one way or another, really shaped who I was. Like, I had played a little bit of Street Fighter before, but I never had a Street Fighter of my own, and that was a game that I just became obsessed with. Like, when I first started playing, my go-to character was Dazlum, because I was like, oh, this guy, he can stretch his arms and his legs. Like, he's got to be the best. You're never going to touch me with this kind of offense. And, like anyone else who jumps into a fighting game, 
I sucked. Did I get him? I don't think I got him. Goddamn that in the room. But like everyone else in uh, who's starting with a fighting game, I got my ass kicked left and right. So I eventually moved on to Balrog, who I think was who I would always stall at, even if I got a little bit far. So I was like, oh, this big mean boxer guy, he's got to be the best. And he was my go-to character for years. And one thing I loved, and my favorite memory with Street Fighter, is playing with my brother, my older brother. He's 11 years older than me, but he always would play video games with me, which was awesome. And it got to the point where I could kick his ass almost every time, but he would still come back and play. Just, you know, looking back, I realized, oh, he was doing this to bond with his little brother. So when you have those kind of memories like that, it's a thing you have to love. And this is back in the day before... I knew that the sound was really bad on that version for the Genesis. Or, you know, when I'm looking at Ken's stage and I'm going, why is the water green? I'm not really thinking twice about it. I'm just like, nah, you know, dumb video game stuff. So for all the problems that Super Street Fighter 2 has on the Genesis and the way Capcom kind of rushed and botched the port a little bit, like they always did for the Genesis, I still, it's it's my favorite fighting game ever for, besides the fact that it's great. But it's just a ton of nostalgia thrown in there. And it's funny because in that pack of games, he also got me Eternal Champions. Which, I didn't have gaming magazines growing up. But I always, I had like two maybe, like ever. And this always had ads splattered through it. And my best friend growing up got EGM. And for like a year straight, like they were, Sega was hyping the ever-living hell out of this game. They wanted this to be their exclusive Street Fighter killer so badly. And it wasn't. It wasn't at all. It didn't come close. Is it a bad game? Absolutely not. But is it a really great game? Also, no. It's weirdly, painfully average. Like, the graphics are great, and it's got huge, giant sprites. And I love the aesthetic of fighters from all across time coming together to get their soul back to come to life. Great concept. I love the fact that it has its, like, danger room training thing where you can set all the different traps and dangers and all that kind of stuff. That's cool. Just the fighting mechanics aren't great. The music's very bland. It's got fatalities, but they're not, like, super cool fatalities and very level-specific. So there's a lot here that you kind of go, huh? And, oh, yeah, the computer AI is ridiculous. Like, this game's AI... This game's AI is up there, I think, with like Mortal Kombat 2 on the Genesis for just how unfair it can get after a certain point. So I've never even beaten this, but I never wanted to. And it was always that game where I'd play with my friends growing up, or even my brother, and we would just get bored. So you know the worst thing you can be as a game. like You can be good, or you can be really bad, but if you're boring, that's pretty much worse than anything else. So, yeah, I, that, from an early stage, that kind of made me lean more towards the Street Fighter kind of fighting game than anything else. Even though I love me some Mortal Kombat too, but I always just went back to Street Fighter as like, I've never played a better fighting game up until that point. Next up, a series I know all too well. Streets of Rage 3. So I went out eventually and got the box, for, the actual box for it. I had one of the clear boxes for it before. But growing up, my story behind this is I would... We would go to my one uncle's house all the time. He lived up the street from us. And he his his son was only about two to three years older than me. So when the dads would all hang out and, you know, cop buddies and they would just sit around, play pinochle and get drunk together, you know, he would dump the he would dump me off on his son. But he was always really cool about it. His name's Demet. And he had he had a good Sega Genesis collection. And he had some Super NES games too. And he was big into wrestling. And I have to give him credit where he was a WCW fan back in like 94, 95 when no one, especially in the Northeast, no one was watching WCW back then. But the way my bro my brother had those rubber stiff, like eight inch tall wrestling figures growing up of, you know, Iron Sheik and Hillbilly Jim and Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant and Roddy Piper. He had a shitload of that line. So those are the wrestlers I grew up playing with. So I'd go over to my cousin's house, and WCW had its like own version of those toys. They were slightly shorter, but I'd be there, and I'd be like, who the hell's Vader? Who's this guy with half face paint and blonde hair? Oh, look, Hulk Hogan. So, like, I was, 
like it was like he was a big wrestling fan and he had fire pro back when no one had fire pro he's the first person actually who i ever saw import a game because he was the only he he had a saturn he's one of the very few people i knew back in the day who had a saturn and he had an action replay card and he would import the fire pro games which that level of dedication was really like that was pretty niche in the mid 90s so thinking back i was like Man, he was really hardcore about his games when he was going through that much trouble. But I think that was more of how big a wrestling fan he was. I went out I went off the rails. But back to Streets of Rage. My favorite game to play when I went over there was always Streets of Rage 2. Like I would play through his games, but that one was just the one that always sucked me in. And it's easy to say because Streets of Rage 2 is a perfect game. But I didn't have a Streets of Rage game for the longest time until this night. So my dad came home with Streets of Rage 3 and I was like Oh my god, Streets of Rage! Because back when you're a kid, you don't know this is the first one, this is the second one. You go, oh my god, this is that game. So I rush in, I plop it in, and yeah, it's Streets of Rage 3. It was completely different than Streets of Rage 2, but it was still me having a Streets of Rage game, which I was so damn excited for. And if you've been following this page for any bit of time, you know how much I love Streets of Rage. Like You look at our Streets of Rage 4 uh, review and just hear me wax poetic about how it homages and takes stuff out from every single Streets of Rage before it. So that's my series. That's 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 my favorite series. If I had to pick a favorite series, it's Streets of Rage. And having one of them, even though it's painfully, ridiculously hard, I still I I can't not love it. One for being a surprise, and two for being my first Streets of Rage. So all the flaws in the world that it has. It's still very close to my heart. Beer break. All right, next up, going to talk about Shadowrun for the 10,000th time. And I've already talked about it this episode. So, like I said, I really can't stress enough how this game, like, changed my thoughts, at least to a little bit, on story and video game. I know I really don't care about story and video game, but, like I said, this story really drew me in. And it was the first one where a story unfolding in a game was like an experience for me. Where I would do something. And instead of just moving left to right to kill people or to jump on something. I was opening up this world more and more with every little thing that I figured out. Being at the point where I'd be hopelessly lost until I'd talk to that one right person. Who would put me in the right direction with something that I would remember from ages ago. Like I loved getting lost in the caves in this game. I loved getting... You know, on the edge of my seat for any of the shadow runs where you're breaking people out of prison and being caught in there with alarms going off, fighting through waves of soldiers. I love the I love the language in it. I love the frag face and the good luck in your troubles and everything like that. I just it it felt like a completely different world and experience to anything I'd experienced before. And it's the kind of thing where none of my friends growing up or my cousin were RPG players. It wasn't until Final Fantasy VII for a lot of them that they really experienced it for the first time, like most people in the West. So this was my first one. And weirdly enough, I never went out looking for games like this again. But maybe the fact that I had an N64 as a follow-up to the Genesis probably didn't help. But yeah, I just can't say enough how much I hold this game close to my heart. And the, the music is so underrated for a small-budget Western release game. Pardon me. There's just so much about this game that I could go on about. And if you want, check check our page, check the review of it. You can hear once again just how much I love this game. Whew. So, next up, gonna be a very different kind of game. We're gonna go to the deeper cuts with Predator 2. So when I was a kid, I think I'd seen Predator 1, and I didn't even know that Predator 2 was a thing. My biggest knowledge about Predator back in this time was the toy line of Aaron vs. Predator and how really they were just hyping up this huge crossover. And the toys looked awesome. My one friend, Dan, growing up had a ton of the AVP toys. And they were just so cool with all their different designs and all their awesome futuristic weapons and their exploding guts. Like, that's a kid's wet dream when they're 9 in the 90s. So, I remember the toys being awesome. So when I saw this game, I was like, oh, holy crap, I know that thing. And playing through it, it was it's a top-down isometric running gun, but it's like objective-based. Like you have to go around and you have to save civilians and not be hunted down by the predator. So 
it's not like your standard running gun. It's kind of its own little weird game in general. There's not a lot of games I can really think about. Like, it's not in that it's too free-roaming and mission-based to be like an Akari Warriors, but it's also isometric and open, so it's not like a Gunstar Heroes. It's like a weird mishmash of the two. I guess maybe like Rambo 3 on a Genesis would be like one of the closer ones I could get, but this is also more isometric. It's weird, but... The biggest thing that stood out to me as a kid about this game was just the level of gore. So, at certain points, you'll see the uh, the triple lasers coming for you. They'll either be coming for the civilians you have to save or for you. And when the Predator kills either a civilian or you, you just blow up into these big, hunking body parts with, like, eyeballs and hearts and different organs going in different directions. And this blew my mind as a kid. This was... Like, I signed the Hedgehog and was playing my brother's Atari at this point. I didn't see anything like this. So, it was a game that was also kind of too hard for me as a kid. I never beat it. Um, you know, I would get stuck on certain boss fights for the longest time. And then I'd eventually kind of beat that. And I think when I was in my teens, the farthest I ever got was the Predator spaceship. And I died there and just got mad and never went back. But last year, I finally went back and beat the game. So, it's it's very beatable, but... It's short. You can get through it in like 40 minutes if you know what you're doing. It's fun. It's got a pretty decent soundtrack to it. Solid control scheme. It's one of those. It's a really, really underrated game from that 16 bit era. And it's a pretty goddamn cool exclusive. I think it has a Master System port too, which is decent. But I just imagine in general it's just way better on the Genesis. So if you're looking for one of those hidden gen kind of games that no one really knows about and say, Really cool use of a license. Predator 2 is one to look for. And speaking of licensed games, and I have a very weird box for this. Like, take a look at this box. It's got, like, all the instructions and the story and how to play written all over it. Like, this is just the National Clearinghouse for Alcohol and Drug Information. What? That's, that's what's on the back of this box. So... This is power line instructions? What 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 is this? Like if anyone out there knows what this is from, please someone tell me for this kind of rental box. But yeah. Universal Soldier. It's a game that I've talked about a lot. It's Turkin 2, it's just a butchered version. So they took out the flying level, they took out some of the other levels, they made specific levels and changed sprites in this from Turrican to fit the license, like barely. Like, the only way the license ever comes through in this game is one of the boss battles, and that's in, like, the very beginning of the game. Besides that, it's straight running gun Turrican. So, Turrican is not a game for everyone, but if it's a style that you like, this, it's playable. I get why people kind of hate it, and I get why they say it's a bastardization of the series, but I just, this was the first one I had, so it's the one I spent the most time with. I My favorite memory with that game is... Like it has a password system, so I eventually did beat the game by, you know, putting in passwords, writing them all down on loose leaf, eventually going into the last one and being able to beat the game. But there was one day where I was like, you know, screw this, I have nothing to do, I'm going to sit down and beat this game from beginning to end. And I remember starting at like 2 in the afternoon, and I don't think I got done until 6 o'clock at night. And it's not that the game's even all that long... But some of the levels you can just get lost in like crazy. Like, some of them are just ridiculously cryptic. You can easily get enough lives to go through it, especially if you know what you're doing. But it was just one of those things where it's like, I had a goal, I was going to beat it. And at that time, that was like the longest I'd ever binged one game straight just for the sole purpose of beating it. So it felt like such an accomplishment when I finally beat that last boss. And it's one that I just always go back to. And the Stage 2 theme in that game is actually stage one in actual Turrican 2. And that's one of my favorite music tracks of all time. I I put it in my, you know, five mediocre games with great music list. I just think, uh, maybe I'll, if I remember, I'll put a link below later on. But look look for uh, Turrican 2 level one music just in general, and you'll, you'll hear the track in one way or another. It's Universal Soldier level two music. If you want to hear some really good, Early 90s, 16-bit era, you know, chip tuning music. That's one to go for. So, yeah. I guess if you have seen anything about me over the years, 
between the run and gun games and the fighting games and the one more westerny RPG, that kind of sums me up in a lot of ways. So very, very influential day. And just the surprise factor of it and being for my dad for no reason. It's it, Those are six games that while arguably half of them are mediocre at best, there's still six of... And even I even even listed them on my like my favorite games of all time, but that stack of six games is probably the one that I hold cl- pretty much closest to my heart. Like that stack of games and some of the games that my wife got me over the years. So yeah, that is the story of my favorite bundle of games that I've ever gotten. And on that note, I'm gonna round out this episode. So final thoughts on the beer. It's not great. Nothing special, but. If you like grapefruit, you'll probably enjoy this, or just biting straight up into a blood orange. So if that's your thing, have at it, man. But for me, nah, it's a pass. And it doesn't even have enough alcohol to really make me want to come back or ever drink multiple of them to get drunk to see how it'll be. It's just, it's a little bit of a misfire. But on its own, it's not a terrible beer, I guess I'll say. And that, that'll pretty much round out this episode, guys. So once again, just want to get this quicker episode out there for you is... We really do appreciate you guys checking the episodes out every week, especially you patrons. Once again, thank you so much for sending in your questions. And as always, guys, make sure to check our links to, for all of our video game reviews for next week's episode of the podcast where we're going to have a special guest. And check out Patreon if you want to get some uh, you know, exclusive content. Or check the links below. We got some merch. Buy our merch. Buy our t-shirts, please. And on that note, guys, cheers. <laughs>